Welcome everyone to the first AGM of TGM. Switch that panel, that's all right. Hand you over to Graham Cowie to do the first item on the agenda. Yeah, so hello everyone, just to give a kind of brief overview of what we're going to cover today. If you can cross Sunday. We're, there are a number of items that we're going to deal with today. Just want to make sure that everybody knows what we're going to be doing. The first thing that we're going to do is take note of the minutes of the general meeting of September 2022, uh, which was circulated with the notice pack. Um, then Sandy will give a chair's report. We will then also take note of the accounts of the, the company for the financial year ended Friday the 30th of September 2022. Our treasurer, Andrew Holloway, will be able to speak to that. We will then consider, and if thought fit, approve a resolution to replace our articles of association with an updated set. Uh, there are two things that that's going to be doing, which we will discuss later. And then finally, we will declare, of course, the results of the TGF director elections before going on to the Q&A session of the evening. I would ask those who are joining us by Zoom, if you could please keep yourselves muted throughout this just so that the feed isn't interrupted at all and if you have any questions that you would like us to ask for the Q&A please put them in the chat facility. I think that's pretty much everything. Great, thank you Graham. So first of all welcome everyone, thank you for attending our AGM. I just wanted to start by introducing your board for the last year. Alongside me, we have Graham Cowie, our secretary, who you've just heard You're from. Not really messing much his me. right is Stuart Callison, a board twice. member. On my left is Andrew Holloway, <laughs> our treasurer, and of course, new club board director. Congratulations to Andrew for that elevation. Ian McKinnon, over to my left, is holding things together on the technology front and will be busy in the room later. Stuart Goldie is also in the room awaiting the election result to see whether his board tenure is extended. So good luck to all the candidates when the results are announced later. We also have two retiring board members, Gary Tanner and Alan McGraw, uh, in the room, of which more later. And finally, we have apologies from Heather Holloway, who has inescapable work commitments this evening. Introductions now done, I wanted to just give a little review of activity since we last spoke to you in a forum such as this, at our EGM in September. First, on membership. At that time, we had 834 members, and that has now increased to 1,372 That's members. More than 900 of these members are paying at least £10 per month, and we have enlisted more than 300 new members since the end of the football season. Membership has trebled since the previous elections in May 2022, when this board was elected. We thank all members for their financial support, whether monthly contributions or the various substantial one-off generous donations which we have received. The income pledged by members will allow us to meet our budget commitments to the football club in respect of their 2023-24 season's budget. Thank you for helping us towards that important target. I just wanted to move on and recap on a few of the things we have been up to since the EGM. When I started researching this, I realized we'd done more than I thought we'd done. We produced our commentary on the 2022 accounts and published that last year, providing warnings over the financial margins of safety that the losses had eroded to a perilous level. Disputed by some at the time, sadly, this was more prophetic than we would have liked. Around this time, we also published our members only email from Doha to Der Derby, focusing on what we could learn about fan ownership from elsewhere and what good looked like. We then attended the club AGM. Thank you to all member shareholders who gave us proxies. At the AGM, we, with others, asked a series of financial questions of the club board. We believe that this scrutiny and challenge was important to what followed. We then had a constructive meeting with the trustees of PTFC Trust. This was facilitated by Brian Welsh, who should be thanked for getting everyone in a room. At that meeting, there was agreement to form a short life working group, representing a wider group of fans than simply TGF members. TGF contributed strategic papers and documents to the group, and the group agreed a way forward by January. This process worked well, 
and the trustees should be thanked for their involvement too, as well as the other fans who gave up their time. Of course, in between times, we continued to communicate with you all and to perform media work, and then the old club board decided to stand down. We were invited to and participated in a meeting about the composition of the interim club board. TGF were invited to have direct representation, but concluded it was preferable to nominate Caroline Mackey at that time and leave our board intact for the challenges ahead. In January, TGF contributed to the club in a few different ways. We funded Lee Hodson's loan extension, which was wanted by the manager at the time, whilst also suggesting a couple of innovative and unique sponsorship opportunities, which saw some members attend a pre-match press conference and some other lucky members win a day out at hospitality. Through the generosity of one member, we were in fact able to offer further monies to the club for the playing budget at the end of the transfer window. We introduced some potential investors to the club due to the financial situation and also became involved in that process in trying to bring some investment into the club. Some of the suggestions we made at the time relating in particular to future board club, football club board composition should feature in future governance models. We've also continued to work with lawyers and the remaining trustees to get everything put in place for the new model for the PTFC Trust to give TGF a seat at the ownership table. We do apologize for going a little quiet for a few months. That's not our natural modus operandi, but hopefully you can now all understand why. It wasn't just that we all needed to get our voices back after our fabulously supported event at the record factory before the Rangers Cup match, but we had some obligations to the club board, which we wished to comply with. We're looking forward to getting back to our more noisy, regular communications soon. We have continued to support Partick Thistle Women's Team, Jags for Good, and the PTFC Charitable Trust. We also, thanks to the initiative, efforts, and financial support of Graham Cowie, hosted around 50 displaced Ukrainians at Fir Hill, a proud moment for our community purpose. We have supported both the introduction of Her Game 2 initiative to Fir Hill, as well as supporting the PTDSA. And of course, we have continued to sell pin badges. We were mocked by some for doing this, but it does generate revenue for the club, as well as from feedback, put smiles on some of your faces each month. So we are proud of that initiative. And we should thank the pins distribution department volunteers who are at the back of the room tonight. Finally, and most recently, we were finally able to be transparent with you about the financial position at the football club. That was a difficult paper to write. There were a few iterations of it. But owners of any private limited company should be entitled to that knowledge. And we set it out starkly and as we would like to hear it. Your response to this has been phenomenal and we cannot thank you enough. We have also concluded running a democratic election process. The quality of candidates willing to stand has been excellent and we are most encouraged by this. Renewal of the board and representation of all groups is essential to ensure the foundation remains relevant and vibrant. Thanks to all those who have decided to stand and also to all those who voted. An excellent turnout, as we will hear from Graham later. When I spoke last year at the EGM, I commented that fan ownership ought to be fan-initiated, fan-influenced, fan-focused, and fan-led. It seemed unthinkable at that time that we may arrive at that outcome. But I think in the nine months since then, we have genuinely started making substantive progress towards that stated ambition. It would be remiss of me not to take the opportunity to thank the rest of your TGF board for their commitment, hard work, support of each other and great resilience over the last year. It has been a great team to be part of. So let us move on to the formal business of the meeting now. But in the meantime, a final sincere thanks from me on behalf of the entire TGF board for the incredible support you have given us. We, re we remain privileged to represent you all. Challenges remain ahead, but at least we are in control of our own destiny for Partick Thistle, and this can now be what it should always have been, what we choose to make of it. With all the talent in our fan base, 
I'm sure we will be making the most of that opportunity. Yeah. Very briefly, sorry, very briefly, we should take note of the, the minutes of the EGM in September. Those were circulated beforehand. As long as no one has any comments on those, we will take note of that as a group. Let's take a proposal and a seconder just to that we have taken note. Any volunteers in the room? We've got Alan Holloway at the back and a seconder. We'll, we'll take take uh, Stuart Stewart. So that's us sorted on that front. The next item, I believe, is with Andrew, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'll take this. Uh, thanks very much. I am going to talk to the accounts very briefly for the year to 30 September 2022, although. They are almost entirely irrelevant as they don't really tell the story of, of where we are now. In those accounts which were circulated ahead of the meeting, um, we report income of 51,000, costs of about 20,000 in a surplus, which translates to cash of, of just over £30,000. If you think about that period, that, that was a 12-month period generating revenue of 51,000. The foundation at a gross level is now generating pins and pre-fundraising over £13,500 a month solely from member subscriptions. So if you, if you think about that and you add the pin badges number in, the income for the year ended 30 September 2022 is made in about three and a half months of under the current um, support model. The, the growth in revenue has, has been incredible. Last, this time last year we had a payment pause as, as, TG, as, a, as the TGF boards transitioned. We had less than 500 members at, at one point. Um, and it's a tribute, I think, to the hard work of you all that, that, that we've got to, to where we have. So in terms of expenses last year, um, we had a fairly substantial cost in just getting things organized in terms of tidying up the articles. Our biggest cost, our second biggest cost, as I said, from legal professional fees is, is the use of the software. We've got a fairly complicated, I say, and I'm just looking at Graham because Graham Kivy is the master of said software. Really complex software package, and we pay commission when we as we gather income through the platforms. That will continue to be a cost. And when I report gross income per month of over 13.6, that is pre that that commission cost. We in in those accounts 22, there will have been some cost in events, and you know, we have ran some some good member events, and we'll continue to do that. I think member events are important. It allows you to get to know your board. It allows us to get together as a group, and it allows us to enjoy each other's company. At the same time, as in, in those accounts, there'll be a fairly substantial cost for the website, which we revamped um, on appointment. The accounts um, end with a surplus of thirty and a half thousand pounds. To give you an idea, just over the last week. Um, income today into the bank account was the best part of £2,600 just for a day. Um, we're beginning to see that uptick from the increased number of members, 300 new members in the last week. We had some very kind one-off donations that went either directly to bank or, or through. So the, the foundation is in good financial health. We've contributed £50,000 just last week to the football club. We've got an ongoing commitment to meet £10,000 a month from the 1st of July, and I am as confident as I can be that, we'll, that we can meet and beat that commitment. This, I'm, I'm not trading on anyone else's toes when I say more pin badges to come and, and keep your eyes out for them, and there'll be a number of fundraising initiatives that we will launch to, to keep growing that income level. Um, I should note as well that there were a number of, of one-off donations that were substantial in the period, some from people in this room, I'm not going to name people and embarrass them, but I think a heartfelt thanks from all of us here for people who were really willing to go deep and put their hands in their pockets so that we could fund certain things. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be absolutely honest, the accounts for next year will be probably a whole load more interesting and representative of the foundation that we're all part of. So on that note, unless there's any questions which you're more than welcome to ask, I'm going to draw the treasurer's report to a close. Right, thank you. Back to you again. Hey, thanks, thanks, Andrew. 
Um, we're now going to move on to the resolution. I'm going to hand over to Graham Cowie for this. Yep. So you will have seen in the notice that there is a resolution effectively to substitute our existing set of articles of association with a new set. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want to make two main changes that will allow us to do things that we currently can't do or can't do as well as we would like to be able to do. The first of those changes is to implement the fan ownership model, the corporate trusteeship model that was set out in the fan ownership roadmap uh, back in, I think, late, de late December, early January, um, whereby the Jags Foundation, instead of being a direct holder of shares in the football club, will instead be a trustee of the PTFC trust. Um, that means that our existing rules weren't quite there in terms of making sure that we have the flexibility to be able to discharge those duties properly. Think of this vote as a, a proxy for whether you agree with us going ahead with the corporate trustee model and getting that done, getting that over the line. For a bit of context, the PTFC Trust has also been revising its own uh, trust deed. Some of you, who, if you're season ticket holders, will have received correspondence about that in the last week or so. They intend to have an indicative vote of their own just to get a bit of democratic legitimacy behind this model from their side of things as well. Um, we would encourage people to vote in favour of it. The corporate trustee model was very much one that the that TGF helped to formulate and was very keen to see followed through from the working group. So that's the first set of changes. The second set of changes is to allow us to have non-voting under 16 members. In the original Articles of Association, we restricted membership only to those over the age of 16. There are complicated company law rules why it's a bad idea to have voting members who are minors in law. Um, and that was why the original decision was taken to keep that nice and simple. There's been a lot of demand from our members for under 16s to be part of the fan ownership journey. So this is effectively relaxing the rules, making sure that we are able to involve them in as full a capacity as possible, short of formal voting rights. So they'll be able to be involved in survey responses, they'll be able to buy thistle pins, they'll be able to participate in all of the other kind of democratic engagement mechanisms that the JAGS Foundation offers. But in order to do that, we need to have this, this new class of membership. All going well, if you agree to these changes, we plan to launch that under 16 membership at the start of July. The process of agreeing this is a special resolution because we are changing the Articles of Association. That means that 75% of those voting in the meeting need to vote in favour of it in order for those changes to pass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take firstly those who are participating online, if that's okay, just to get the vote, the numbers there. We will then also take a vote of numbers in the room. It's simply by a show of hands and we will count those numbers. We'll have them, them sorted out and then we will declare that result later just so that we don't hold things up too much, if that's okay. I'm going to ask those who are participating remotely if they are in favour of the motion, if you could please use the raised hand feature now. I will give you another five to 10 seconds. Okay, if I could then ask everybody who's got their hand up now to put it down. And I think that's everybody down. Two still up, two legacy hands, as I think we technically call it. That's fine. Okay, don't worry. And those who are against the adoption of the motion, uh, who are participating remotely, if you could please raise your virtual hand. Now, okay, we'll take those two as legacy hands. That, that's that. That's fine. Okay, and we'll now move into the room. Those in favour of the adoption of the new Articles of Association, if you could please raise your hands. 
And if you could now lower your hands, those against, that would be quicker. I believe that motion is carried unanimously. Uh, so thank you very much for endorsing that. That allows us to move forward. Right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we now move on to declare the results of the 2023 director elections. Um, Graham is going to uh, present this part. I'm just going to say, could the winning, oh, winning is the wrong word, the elected, the elected, successfully elected directors, please come to the front so that everyone can see who you are. Once, once um, I've obviously announced once, the results. Once, once <laughs> announced. So we had a fantastic democratic engagement process in the last month or so. Uh, the total eligible electorate for this election was 1,054. There were six candidates who nominated themselves. And the, yeah, the, the turnout was absolutely incredible. We had 703 members voting in the election by e-ballot using choice voting, which represents 66.7% of the eligible electorate. That's marginally higher than it was last year, obviously on a much bigger base as well. So first and foremost, I want to thank everybody who was involved in that election, both as a candidate and as a voter. Now to the results themselves. I'm gonna read out the candidates and then the number of votes that they received in order by surname. Let's do it that way. So Jack Carson received 466 votes. Jack Parry received 60 votes. And we'll come back to that. Is it Goldie? Yes, Stuart Goldie received 433 votes. Then Lindsay Kane received 487 votes. Derek McLeish received 328 votes. And John McNeil received 247 votes. There were three positions available for election. Therefore, I am pleased to announce that Lindsay Kane, Jack Carson, and Stuart Goldie have been elected for a maximum three year term to the Jack Uh, well done to all the candidates, and we all look forward to working with you. Um, in respect of Lindsay and Jack, who are, are new to the board, um, when new board members arrive, that means that some depart, and we have got small gifts for the departing members, and I thought it would be a nice touch for the new members to pass over the gifts to the departing members. These were purchased not with foundation funds. <laughs> I, I should just pass my thanks on to Gary and Alan as well. They've been terrific support to to me personally and the whole board during their 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 year in office um, and they've done a fantastic fantastic job representing the foundation so that's the formal part of the meeting over and um, we're now going to have an informal q a for anyone that on this gorgeous warm summer's evening wants to stay longer and ask questions we'll gladly take them all right any questions folks uh, i'll come and see you with the mic just so that everyone in zoom can hear us as well so we did actually pay a bit to hire this so it'd be good if it got used you know so if anyone's got a question now's the time
<laughs> Anyone at all? If you're online, please feel free to put something in the chat bar. I think we've got, oh, we've got one here from Len. Oh, I've got quite a few now. Hold on. Uh, Andrew Law asks, since the Cestral resolution has been passed, can an elected member of the under 16s group be added to the board to represent the younger fan base? Shall we take the, the technical answer on this? Let's go for the technical answer. Uh, minors can't be directors of limited companies. Uh, that's the, the main constraint on that. However, we are looking to explore ways of facilitating democratic engagement from that group. And um, that's, you know, the, the, the first stage of this is to make sure that they can become members. We will find a way to have their voice heard, even if it's not done through the formal strictures. Uh, let's see, second question from Len Hoover. How far away are we from being able to uphold our 10K a month commitment to the club? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we're really, really close to being able to deliver it, um, but we'd like to do more, I think is, is the answer to that question. I think I mentioned about 13.6k gross a month pre-pins and pre-fundraising. That will translate post all the, the costs that flow in to, to probably around about or just more than £10,000 a month. So, yes, we can put 50 in, and yes, we can give 10k a month to the club. I'm confident we can do that for the next 12 months. The foundation doesn't just exist to fund the football club, though, and that's important. Fan ownership involves supporting the wider community, and we would love to continue to keep a close relationship with causes like the Charitable Trust, Jags for Good. We, we will obviously we've contributed to the women's team before as well. The community piece is important for us. We've talked before about participatory budgeting, and we will talk about that again. So right now, yes, we can do it. But this foundation board, the new board as elected, I don't believe we'll be sitting on our hands and we'll be asking members to, to continue to support the work of the foundation, to, to put as much money on the table for us as possible, to, to think about how we best deploy that. Um, I'll put a different hat on right now. Um, <laughs> That I had that I we I, I now wear as of yesterday. The the football club board obviously would be delighted if the foundation could contribute more to the football club. I think that's an obvious point to make. The financial disclosure that was made last week was yeah, it, it set out the financial picture. Um any any funds, extra funds, particularly in August and January, that we can put towards the football club will be very gratefully very gratefully received. And that, again, is something the Foundation Board will consider. We've got any more questions in the room? Otherwise, we do have another one. Oh. Hi there. I think to everyone, it's always that the future of the club really depends on the, the expansion of the fan base. I and mean, we should have many, many more thousand of people coming in week after week uh, to support the club. Um, is there a perspective, I'm not asking for detailed plans, uh, is there a perspective on how the relationship between the foundation and the club going forward can actually address this, qu this question of getting more uh, people from the enormous sympathy that there is for the club around turning that into uh, act actual uh, fans? As I say, not definite plans, but is there emerging a, a, plan, a perspective on how this is going to happen? Um, can I take that one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things that I'm really interested in. It's one of the reasons I, I got involved with the Jags Foundation because I think everyone in this room, we all know lapsed Jags fans. Yeah. We all know them. Um, personally, the, 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 the people that I started going with as a kid, they all dropped away during the back-to-back -back relegations of 04, 05, and most of them didn't come back. Um, what I think, what frustrated me about previous club boards was they just dismissed it as, that's ah, all about results. It's all about results. That's all that matters is results. Now, there is some truth in that, but we support Patrick Thistle. We can't rely on results, right? So you need to start looking at other ways to, make, to get people through the gate. Um, I visited Bohemians in Dublin a few years ago, just before the pandemic. 
and uh, managed just I, the kind of club they are. I just got talking to the chief executive in the bar before the game, and um, one of the things he said was exactly that. He said, "He said we chased it for years. They've been fan owned since since day dot." He said, "But we chased it for years in terms of you know results, 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 and they nearly bankrupted themselves doing it, like many clubs in Scotland have done." So I think you need to look at what else can you do. I actually think that getting involved in the community is huge. That's why I think what Jags for Good have done is so important because it not only does it raise money for great, great causes, but it's PR that the, the, the club just can't buy otherwise. And I think that's a, 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 great, a, a, a great example of um, people really having a really high opinion of the club as a result of that. Um, I also think there's various things we can do in terms of, of match day as well. Um, and, you know, some of these things cost money, but, but some of them don't. And I think for me, it's about building our identity as a club and not just having that based on results, because we can't do that. I mean, so many clubs have tried to do it, you know, by success. It doesn't work. And sooner or later, you're going to end up in trouble. So, yes, results are important. And we, we saw the potential in these playoff games, how big... Uh, potential we've got in terms of the support and that's great but I think it wasn't just about the team doing well in those games it was about the atmosphere that's been created all season by this amazing uh, group of young supporters that we've got um, coming through and other young people really want to be part of that and as a result I saw people at these games that I hadn't seen for 10 years and I'm sure there's many that will say the same so yes it would be great if it was all about results but I also think it's about building the identity of the club and hopefully the Jags Foundation have been a big part of that. Jags for Good have been a big part of that. I actually think the women's team have been a huge part of that as well. They've been a tremendous example um, to the club. And um, I think it's the women's team have been, uh, women's football in general, is uh, some people go to that who just simply don't enjoy going to the men's game for various reasons. So I think that's a great, ent that's a great gateway to the club as well. So there's lots of things, and um, I think over the next couple of years, now that we've really got, now that we're really building the relationship with the club board, um, and we're going to have more involvement there, it's something I'd really like to to get involved with. But it's not easy. It's not an overnight thing. That's what everyone I think needs to understand. It's not an overnight thing. This is like a five, ten, maybe fifteen year uh, process to get people through the door because you can't buy it because we've seen that before. But um, it's something I, I I'm really looking forward to getting to getting more involved with now that things have really improved with the relationship with the club. Yeah, and I'll just actually add to that as well that I think it was yesterday, perhaps the day before, I had a conversation with someone that's um, done fan engagement, uh, digital media marketing, building community for a few few major clubs in England. Uh, and immediately after the call, he sent me a tailored uh, slide deck for Parrick Thistle. Um, and today uh, I... Had a meeting with Alistair Creevy, the new chairman of the football club. I asked him if if the board would consider looking at this slide deck, which is very good, which really talks about a lot of the things that Ian's talking about. Um, and I, I really hope that um, together the Jags Foundation and the club board can embrace that and try and build this identity together. We have a, a couple of questions on the uh, Zoom chat relating to the club's budget, which I'll try and package together if that's okay uh andrew um the first question from martin towers is have tgf been given oversight of the club's budget for next season um and also there's a question from john butler are we able now to confirm that the current ptfc board will not be able to mismanage funds again without us knowing about it <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's been a, yeah that's one for you isn't it apparently so yeah um I, I would I would answer the second question with the fact that this TGF board, and particularly two of us who were under NDAs for quite a while with the football club, are can hundred percent say that there is budgetary control in place at the football club. Um, there are very very detailed models and forecasts that run based on what I think we think is fairly sen fairly sensible sensitivities, and to be absolutely clear, are prudently put together and don't bank for upside that doesn't exist or is pie in the sky stuff so to answer the second question i i can endorse the fact that we've got budgetary control in place i, I think what i can say and what tgf said already the accounts for in may 2022 will be ugly um 
23. Sorry, 20, 23. Sorry, the, yeah. But it's moving quickly. And the accounts for May 2023 will, will be ugly. Um, but we know that they'll, they'll be they'll be a difficult read. Um, they will they will highlight the, the difficulties that the football club has faced. What was the first question? First question was have we seen the budget for next year? <laughs> uh, yeah, we have seen the budget for next year. I, I, I don't think we can really say too much more than yeah, but we've, we've seen it and yeah, we understand it and we believe that it's been prepared under a set of prudent principles that, that make sense and which are absolutely deliverable, I would say. I think I think then just to follow up on that, the important thing to remember um about the current season and the result for the current season and addressing that point about budgetary control that we are now we're now satisfied does exist. Is that the the football department overperformed on revenue this season between the Rangers Cup game and also let's not forget they progressed probably further than was budgeted in in the League Cup as well. So that that tells you that the the revenue was higher than was expected, um, despite the league finish of fourth versus second. But the costs were obviously much higher. Um, to more than compensate for that, leading to the leading to the loss, um, and therefore, um, if we can control those budgets and costs, which we're now fairly satisfied is is going to be happening, then um, that is a major obstacle out of the way to to reach break even point. I'd actually put it earlier, but um, name's William Malcolm, by the way. Good evening. Um, you might not be able to ask, answer this question as a trust, but uh, it kind of snuck in uh, just prior to the playoffs that the way it had the major shut sponsorship, which I would have said was probably the main sponsorship. I may be wrong with that, you know, as a club. There was no mention at all of numbers, even approximate numbers. What sort of deal is it? I believe it's a two year deal. To me, that was a pretty major thing, given what we found out after the playoffs. Do we have any comment to make on that? I mean, I'm not, I don't need, it's not confidential information I'm looking for, but I just feel that it just seemed to be all of a sudden there. Nobody mentioned it much because we were all involved in other things. But that's a major thing for Party Thistle, I would say, shirt sponsorship. I don't know if we can make any comment on that as a foundation. Yeah, I, th I think the, the comment I'm going to make, you might not like, but we'll, we've been quite clear about the delineation between fan-owned and fan-run. And obviously there's employees and there's a board of directors to make the commercial decisions of the football club. They've made that decision. I think we've shown that we'll robustly challenge in terms of our uh, financial analysis where there's a need to do so. But I think in terms of if we were to get involved in every commercial decision, well, well, the immense amount of time that's put in by some of us would would just be uncontrollable. So I think I hear what you say, um, but it's probably not our place to to stray into that area. Not not under the arrangement of fan ownership that we have. Well, we now obviously have board representation, and so we have someone in the room. <laughs> We will who we trust to to challenge the decisions at the point that they're being made rather than retrospectively. Right, uh, yeah. Um Gavin Taylor, if no one knows me. Um to sort of follow on from what you were saying, Andrew, uh your position now on the board, are you confident about being able to deal with the NDA situation being on the board, on the main board? And obviously, being on the board and the, the for the Jags Foundation, one of the. <laughs> Why are you asking that question, Gavin? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's one of, it's one of the areas that uh, certainly at my time I found some difficulty in dealing with that. Uh, granted, it's a completely different board than I was dealing with, um, than you're dealing with now. But um, how do you how, how do you feel you will manage that particular uh... situation? I think the most important point is the point you make. We we live in a different era. Um, if I understand, somebody else watching one point means I'm crashing. 
in prep for my first formal board meeting on Tuesday. Um, things are ran very, very differently than they perhaps were when you were involved in. I think we can laugh about that now, but I, um, um, I, the, the relationship, the exact working relationship between the foundation and the football club board is yet to be absolutely um, tied down. We only really got wind of the fact that a board position was going to be offered last Wednesday. Um, as things moved following the financial disclosure, um, we then obviously had a few things to do. First of all, think, was it the right time to do it? Because at the previous point when we were offered it, we decided when we nominated Caroline, we decided it wasn't the right time. We then had to find somebody silly enough to do it. Um, and then we had to work through a process to, to move, you know, there's all sorts, you'll, you'll know there's all sorts of paperwork and discussions that have to get in place. So now that we're there, um, we're going to work on how we interface it properly. Um, there is also, I think, I wouldn't be the only link between the TGF board and the football club board. There will be other people on the TGF board who will link in directly. I think there'll be, hopefully, be a chair-to-chair -chair relationship, for example. So we're still working on that. Um, what I do believe, though, absolutely, is it, it is the intention of the football club to be transparent and honest with supporters going forward. Um, I'm not saying that wasn't the case before, um, to be clear, but what I am saying is that the football club have learned a lot from the foundation's approach of honesty and transparency and bringing people on the journey and, and talking to people like adults. And I think they've listened and learned from that. They've got a super individual in Brian Welsh does a lot of great work in that area as well. Um, we've got a lot of time for Brian and we, 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 we work with him closely as well. So. It's work in progress. I might be tapping on your door to ask a couple of questions at some point. <laughs> um, but I'm, I wouldn't have taken this on. I, I know you, you've been very generous in sharing your experience with me. Um, I wouldn't have taken this on if I didn't believe that things were going to be markedly different from what you experienced. And I've, my eyes are wide open to the challenges that me, I may face. Yeah, yeah, sure. Any more? Here we are, Ross. Um, it's not so much a, a question, but it's it's kind of two points. Um, the first one builds upon the question that the gentleman here asked and Ian's response to it um, about, you know, winning over or, or attracting new fans. For me, you know, we've seen the impact that the Kids Go Free scheme had. Um, I think that, you know, was re reinforced massively during the playoffs. Um, I think that the resolution that was passed tonight that gives young fans a stake in the a, a potential stake in the ownership of their club really builds on that. And um, my partner might disagree, but I think that was probably the most important resolution or the most important part of tonight. <laughs> um, so, uh, so really, really delighted and really, really encouraged to see that move forward because I think that's the next logical step is giving you know um, young fans you know ownership of their club. I think there are some clubs in this. Uh, city yeah. you know, over in the East End that they might think they're a club for the people of the people. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. There's another club that think they are the people. I wouldn't agree with that either. Um, but no, I, I think it's a, a really, really important resolution that's been passed and I, I congratulate the board on getting that through. Um, and the other point I wanted to make as well is just about the fundraising, the 10,000 target, which you know is, is, I think we all recognise is a bit of a stretch target, but I don't think anybody in this room or sitting at the table at the front should you know feel embarrassed or ashamed or downhearted if they fall even slightly short of that because you know from what i understand of directors fees you know even you know ninety thousand pounds a year well exceeds what people would have expected to pay for seats on the board at the past so please 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 don't get disheartened if you just fall short of that target i think you know it's an ambitious target i think we're nearly there everybody should be proud of that and i don't think anybody should be disheartened if they just miss that slightly we have a question on Zoom, uh, which one are you think they have most of the stock options on? I haven't seen it. There, there is a question on Zoom from Bill Sterling, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is there any possibility to issue non-voting stock to raise an additional money for the team? <laughs> uh I think the the club board um, ha, have difficulties in, in issuing a prospectus because of legal requirements to to raise 
um, funds directly into into the club in respect of um, share sales. We have investigated with them a couple of different ways to tweak that to maybe make that a, a, an option. Um, I think um, the the in the short term they might look at, at using some of those options to attract big ticket investment rather than mass investment. I think they perhaps, I'm not wishing to speak for them, I, I think and hope that they may wish to, to funnel smaller ticket investment through the JAGS Foundation. Um, we made clear in our statement that there's 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 certain benefits of that in terms of VAT, although not against a share issue. I think the clunky admin and the regulation of issuing small shareholdings probably um, don't make it overly attractive to the club. But I, you know, ultimately, it would be for them to say whether they wish to take something like that forward. It's certainly a conversation that's being had. Got a question here? Yeah. Um, you may be unable to answer this question, but clearly there's been a little bit in the media recently about potential investment in the club and that there's been some positive discussions. So on a, a scale of one to 10, with one being nature, how confident would you be that these discussions will prove fruitful? I, again, I don't think that. I, sorry, I'd love to be able to give you a number between one and ten, but we are not the people holding those conversations. Um, at the moment, those conversations would be held with the football club board and the PTFC trust trustees. They're the people that would have to sanction any inward investment into the football club. Um, I th I think that's probably all we can can say just now. Say that the answer is not zero, any chance. I think that's important. There are, we don't have a queue. I don't think there's ever going to be a queue of people queuing down the Fur Hill Road to chuck money into part of this football club. But at the same time, and, and something I would endorse the foundation and this board for, we've not had nobody come to us saying we'd like to back you guys. You know, there are people out there who, who may wish to deploy and. It will be important over the summer that we we post those conversations. We do our diligence properly on these people, and we understand whether they are the right kind of people to yeah. alongside a fan owned, not fan run football club. So, my my thing to you is you you'll hear more on that as as we move through the summer. There's a question. Oh, you want to? I, I was just going to follow up and say that I think we think that private capital can play a part alongside genuine fan ownership. As long as it doesn't dilute fan ownership, uh, we think there are models that allow both to both to coexist. And um, But if we were ever to, to move into that area, we would certainly be consulting with members on it. There's a question from David Patterson online. What are the advantages of the corporate trustee model of ownership? as opposed to holding the shares directly. A trust doesn't strike me as the best way to implement fan ownership. Is this purely what would be allowed by the JAGS trust, by which I assume you mean PTFC trust? Yeah, the technical answer of that can come from Graham, but just to, to say that as an, as an overarching answer, disentangling the PTFC trust would be massively fraught with difficulties and so we had to start finding a solution from where we were rather than trying to disentangle that i suppose what i would add is there there are some advantages to the corporate trustee model in terms of consolidating what we already have in an ideal world we would have had a nice simple one organization holding the shares it would have been a really straightforward setup, like you see at many other clubs. We argued for that historically. That's matter of public record. What this does, though, is it brings together three organizations from different stages in the fan ownership journey and has us essentially working as closely as possible 
to something that, that works alongside that. The other thing to stress is that we wanted to provide the existing trustees with reassurance that this model was going to work. And it's important, you know, the, the appointment of corporate trustees is the first stage. It's worth remembering there are two corporate trustees under this model, including the JAGS Trust, which is also a minority shareholder. And the idea is that this, this provides a transitional period after which we then get into something a little bit more permanent, more enduring. So the let's not let the best be the enemy of the good, I suppose, would be my key message on that. Got a question from Ian Bateman. And can I just say, how good is it to see this man back at Fur Hill where he belongs on a Saturday? Hey, yeah. thanks. <laughs> You might, you might not like this question. Um, given that the previous incumbents didn't exactly splash money on the stadium, are you worried about future costs that could be potentially eye-watering? Well, yes. Um, I, I think the answer is... We, all, we are all aware that we own an ageing asset that requires general upkeep. And in general, as things get older, house, house owners, for example, all homeowners will know that, as things get older, things become a bit more creaky and require more attention. I'm certainly not blind to the fact that for how could do with some love. Um, I'm not close enough to the detail to say much more that, than the fact that in the conversations that that those of us who NDA'd um, had with the football club board provision has been made for what the board believed to be appropriate remedial work to keep the stadium compliant with requirement. I can't say too much more than that because I, I honestly just don't know the detail yet. Did I dodge that one okay, Ian? <laughs> 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 I think everyone can see for themselves what a state it's in, and it's been a concern of foundation members since it was, but you know, since the very start. Um, I'm confident that our board representatives will get to grips because clearly we can't just leave it with plants growing out in the front, the place crumbling, broken windows, etc. Uh, but it's going to be a long-term project, that is for sure. Right, I'd just like to ask. We're preparing for the end of next season if we're in the playoffs. Can you clarify with the SFA if it's okay for Patrick Thistle to take penalties in front of their own fans? <laughs> in all seriousness, in all seriousness, because we did win the toss. <laughs> and I think it needs clarified where in the football rules, it's if you win the toss, you get to pick which end you take the penalties. And that was overruled. So I think it should be clarified with the SFA because you might be playing three games at the end of the season. We'll, we'll pack our new club board member off to his first meeting with that at the top of his agenda. <laughs> Got another question in the room? Um, <clears throat> it was just in, in line with the statement that was issued about the losses, and I believe there was discussion of a tax implication uh, when the, the, if the club ran at a loss over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to understand was how that interlinked with what I believe last year was described as a rather unusual method of valuing the stadium in order to prevent the account showing such a big loss yeah. and how that impacted on the foundation if there was a tax liability associated with it. You don't get these questions at the Rangers AGM, do you? <laughs> uh, the tax position is well understood. I think um, the, the first time a tax charge could bite is 2025. Um, the board are aware, the foundation board are probably pretty aware as well of this potential for a tax charge. Um, we're being advised in it and we know what we need to do to avoid said charge. Um, fancy accounting policy ain't going to make the account that tax charge go away. Um, Prudent financial management of the football club, returning it to a break-even base, and ideally a small surplus, will make that tax charge go away. And that is the target of the board. Um, does that answer the question? 
It does. I suppose it was is more just I presume we are now in a position though where we are going to have to hold the unusual valuation or the club would have to hold an unusual valuation, which I believe it ended with the asset much there's, more valuable than it was likely to be. There is no requirement for the club to use the same accounting policy for that asset in the 2023 accounts than it did in the 2022 accounts. And it will be a point of discussion for the football club board and those on the football club board who are lucky enough to get involved in the audit, um, <laughs> of which I believe I might be one. Um, it will be up to us to have that discussion or, or for the others to have that discussion with us and, and see where we get to. Unfortunately, if you do, if you make a change of accounting policy one season and then make a change of accounting policy again in the next season, you, you have to explain that properly and understand that properly so that there's definitely work to be done there that the, well, the, the foundation board asked a lot of good questions at the AGM and I think the club board, as they are now, are very, very aware of it. Any more? Oh, Jamie. <laughs> um, in terms of the financial situation, obviously it came out that it was a loss. Um, obviously that comes with us having played at Ibrox as well and probably getting a couple hundred thousand for that. So say Ibrox hadn't happened or whatever, the situation of the club probably would have been double A as worse. So what kind of what? How did the previous board manage their budgets, if you even know? Because it clearly was absolutely miles off anywhere that would have brought us to a point that we could survive in. They didn't manage them. I've not signed any NDAs. I don't have any special knowledge. But you don't need to to see that the lack of budgetary control was total. And that was very clear from the questions that were asked of the AGM last November. They didn't bother. They did not manage the budget in any way. Yeah, I think I think we our dialogue's been with the new board rather than the old board. So. Um, we we don't have answers to any questions about how they set their budget, et cetera. But um, what we have concentrated on is making sure budgetary controls in place for moving forward so it doesn't happen again. No, any more questions? Yep, there we are. Hey, Danny Crawford, I've got two simple questions, really. One is, how many people were here at the right to vote, and how many people were on, online and could vote? So how many were involved in the AGM? That's the first question. The second one is, what was the gross uh, expenditure on Partick Thistle last season? Because we're talking about the, lo the loss, but I, I, I'd never see the total gross figure mentioned anywhere. Perhaps I'm just not looking in the right place. How many people? Yeah, so... Yeah, so th those those on Zoom, the the number is twenty four uh, members are, are are here for that, and then obviously those in the room, we've been taking attendance, so we will have the the precise numbers on that. From a quick eyeball, it looks like around about seventy to eighty, give or take. Uh, but we'll we can provide uh, final numbers on that, obviously. And and in terms of the question about gross, I think the question was what are the gross expenses of Park Thistle last year? Was that right? Um, Obviously, the accounts for the year to May 2023 are not prepared nor published yet. So whilst we um, were able to publish as the club board did, what the loss for the year is likely to be, we've not seen detailed accounts yet. And that would be the time to be able to, to answer that question. Usually, I think the AGM's October, November time when those accounts will be published. Yeah, we 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 are not we are not the club board, so we don't have the income figures, so we don't have the expenses figures. We know the deficit as they've informed us what the deficit is. Any more in the room? Yep. Hi, it probably goes back to the uh, budgetary control issue. The last club statement had a comment about employing and 
quote, experienced professional, unquote, might these two be related? No. Was, was that not a reference to Dick that McRae being appointed, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry. That was a reference to Dougie being appointed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I do also believe the club are looking at enhancing the in-house finance function and how that is controlled. And I'd expect that in the public domain, there'll be more in that very, very soon. Okay. There's a oh, oh. So there one. one then. Okay. Come back to that. Sorry to prolong this. Can I just ask are Mr. McCall and Mr. Scally still employees of the club? Are Ian McCall and Neil Scally still employees of the club? So we're not. So when the management team were released from their duties, they weren't. They were essentially put on gardening leave, like they, they essentially were put on their notice. Like any of us leaving a job would be put on their notice. Um, and then we'd run down their contracts to a, and, and then at the end of that contract would would stop being paid. Um I'm not absolutely clear when that point would be, but it, it would be at least my understanding was it was at least six months. The one point to remember there is that. The decision to appoint Pistol and Paul McDonald essentially allowed that action to be cross neutral because Piss and Paul were both already employed by the football club and on the books of the football club. They essentially came out of Thistle. We, Chris was leading, leading Thistle Weir. Um, Paul was the man on the tools as well there. So they, they've essentially come away from that and come into football, continue to be paid. And essentially the old management team were just essentially their contracts were were ran down and will drop off at a point in time. I'm not exactly sure when that point in time will be. And I'm also unclear with and it was that with the next question, no doubt. Archie's obviously taken on a couple of new roles since then. Archie's been at Motherwell and is now at Kilmarnock. Um don't like the idea of Archie at Kilmarnock, <laughs> but but never mind. Um so I'm, I'm not I'm person, I don't know how that operates, but while people shouldn't see the fact that we we remove or or the, the club board at the time removed Ian McCall and Neil Scally and Alan Archibald as something that cost the club any money, it it was neutral, it was totally neutral. We didn't bring anyone in to replace them that wasn't already being paid by the football club. There are two questions uh, we've got uh, online. If we maybe go to those now, uh, John Henderson asks. Are you cited of the scale of the potential tax liability come 2025 if the club does not get to a break-even operation? Is it an existential threat? Can't comment, but I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that we're aware of the existence of this potential tax charge that, that could bite in 2025 and you know, anything I've seen in terms of the, fight, the, the way that we're budgeting and the way we're looking to control the football club going forward, that tax charge won't bite. The final question that we've got uh, on the uh, kind of uh, on, on the online is uh, from Len Hoover. Does TGF have any concerns that the publicity over our financial issues are directly impacting Chris Doolan's recruitment effort? And such publicity could it impact future recruitment efforts? Is there a balance to be struck going forward? May I? Yeah, please. Um, I would say that well, that the uh, publicity was necessary. It was timely, overdue, if you like. Um, it serves two very important purposes. The first is distracting us all from the disaster at Dingwall, which only stung for a few days until we remember about it next season. But that was positive. But even more positive is the fact that by rallying fans in the way that has happened, we have already begun, as Andrew's described, to alleviate that financial situation. Pretending that it didn't exist wouldn't have made Chris's recruitment policies any easier because his budget would be what, what it is. But by actually um, continuing to bring the club together in the way that we saw through the playoffs, 
in the face of a real disappointment, let's be honest, that was a bad one. Um, nonetheless, you see uh, season tickets flying out the door at a faster rate. You see people wearing the shirts that came out yesterday or right here tonight uh, and the queues in the shop at lunchtime. So I would argue that actually what we are doing with the club board and being honest and transparent with people is rallying the fan base, bringing it together and improving our financial situation, not, not the reverse. And just, just if I might, just um, I think it was Ross's point earlier on, I did want to endorse that strongly, the point about the Kids Go Free policy. Uh, and also what Ian said about developing the club's identity. We have an asset, doesn't look like an asset. We have lots of empty seats. They're earning nothing. If we can bring new fans in through the door through more schemes of the same kind, some of them will stick. And gradually, gradually, that fan base will increase and that will bring more money in. And the club's identity and community status in this respect, especially in Glasgow, where our, our rivals have their own very clear identities. And not being that, I actually see as a huge commercial advantage and something that we can build on. But there's those empty seats. They don't need to be empty. You know, if we charged a pound and a thousand extra people came, that's a thousand pounds more than we'll get than if we just leave them empty. So there, it was a great idea that kids go free. It's something that we can really build on. Uh, and I definitely believe that a long-term strategic goal for this board, for future foundation boards, with the club board, is to have that long-term strategy to build up our crowds. And I definitely, I feel so encouraged by the numbers that we were getting. I think from a, a kind of regular two and a half thousand, we absolutely can double that over the next few years. And that in itself will be a huge game changer compared with a very short term approach that we've seen in recent years. And I suppose just to say to Len as well that um, we, we wanted to be transparent with you and tell you this as soon as we became aware of it. The club board asked us not to. Um, the catalyst for our statement was the club board making a statement um, con confiding in everyone of the size of the losses. So the timing wasn't really of, of our choosing. The, the timing was thrust upon us. I don't think there's ever going to be a good time to, to share such news, but um, it, it, it had to be then in terms of the club board's decision not to impact the playing season. Ian, you want another one? I'm just wondering if we know if the previous board actually put any money into the club. Um, one of them might have put other somebody else's money into the football club. Um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I don't believe that any of the previous board incorrect. One of, one of them might have put their own money into the football club, the others didn't. I'm glad we've got some use out of this, Mike, anyway. He's warmed up, so thank you so much. It's 40 quid well spent. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. Um, if that's an end to the Q and A, um, we've worked up a little bit of a thirst. We're going to bring the AGM to a close now. I think some are going to which bar Ian? Harvey's. Harvey's. Some of the um, TGF board are going to Harvey's. So if anyone wants to come have a chat, continue this over a pint, you'll be very welcome there, and we'll see you there. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Cheers. <laughs>